Welcome to the Louisville Probate Law Podcast with Attorney Scott Shanest. He'll provide helpful information about wills, power of attorney documents, and other issues related to probate law in Kentucky. These tips and easy to understand conversations can save you time, money, and stress related to a topic each of us will eventually have to face. Let's join Scott for today's episode. Scott Shanus, welcome back. Today's going to be an interesting topic. Let's get into wills and probate, something a lot of people need and not a lot of people know about, or at least they tend to put that off, sometimes, unfortunately, until it's too late. Hey, I'm glad you're back in the studio. How you been? Happy to be here. I'm doing great, uh, and we talk about this a lot. We uh, do this in our practice, too, wills and probate, common questions. We talk about this all the time to clients, friends, relatives, um, and it seems to be what's on everybody's mind, especially this time of year with all the stuff going on. Well, I mean, there are so many things that really can lead into this conversation with someone. Uh, sometimes it's your kids getting to a certain age. Sometimes it's you're looking at retirement and you really should have had this done already, so you need to, to scramble a little bit. And sometimes, it, for instance, in your workers' comp situation where you've got a substantial award coming in uh, on behalf of a client, they need to kind of protect and think through those assets. And anytime some of these life events, even including a divorce, anytime any of these things happen, you might want to begin thinking about updating any documents that you already have. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. All of those things make you think about this. But the other part about it is everybody's going to have to deal with this at some time or another. If you've gone through a divorce, you've got issues. But even if you don't go through a divorce, even if you don't have a worker's comp claim, uh, will, power of attorney, and living will directive are important for everybody. And and let's get into those topics because those are things that – you know, a lot of people kind of get intimidated by this. Geez, I don't want to think that uh, I'm going to die. I don't even want to think about these documents, so I'm going to put it off, put it off, put it off. But there's a lot of things that can happen that really make it easy for the people around you who have to step in and and kind of take care of things on your behalf if you already have this information completed. That's, that's true. Um, you know, it's common saying that everybody needs a will, but there's a couple of other documents that people need to consider too, the power of attorney and the living will directive and – Um, For most people um, that are not uh, extremely wealthy or in a really difficult situation, like extremely disabled, um, those are going to cover most of of their needs. Probably 95, 90 percent of the people need a will, power of attorney, living will directive. Um, Again, I think everybody's familiar with the will. That takes care of your assets once you pass away. Uh, The benefits to a will is it tells everybody what you want. It also simplifies the process, the probate process we'll talk about in a minute. And the way it simplifies it is it makes it a lot easier, and that translates to being cheaper. So if you have a will, number one, everybody's going to know what you want. Number two, it's going to make the administration of your estate a lot smoother, a lot more efficient, and that means a lot cheaper later on. Um, And then the will also allows you to designate people to take care of business for you after you pass away. You can name an executor. Um, The court doesn't appoint an executor. Uh, you can name somebody that you know that you trust that knows your situation uh, better than somebody who's just pulled out of the literally sometimes thin air by the court. So uh, I think everybody's very familiar with a will. I think everybody knows how that works. I think uh, we need to talk a little bit about what a will uh, is in Kentucky, uh, and uh, we call it a testamentary uh, instrument. Uh, it's really interesting in Kentucky you can do what's called a holographic will, which means you can write one out in your own hand. So as you're sitting here right now, we're talking, you can really write what you want out in your own hand, and that would be a valid will in Kentucky. Um, I've seen in several holographic wills over um, my lifetime as an attorney. Uh, I've yet to see one that was actually prepared the way it should be. Um, anytime somebody that's not an attorney writes one out, there's usually a lot of things that they just don't appreciate and just just can't get done the right way. So um, holographic wills are an easy, cheap way of creating a will, but they usually create more problems than they solve. A lot of times they can. Yeah, and, and unless it's just a very dire situation where you're stranded on a mountaintop and you can't get away and get a hold of somebody, um, I think you want to avoid a holographic will if you can in Kentucky, uh, and you want to avoid anything that might be a holographic will. For instance, you might create a holographic will without knowing it sometimes. If you take up a napkin and you write down on it what you want to happen to your state after you pass away and you sign it, you may have created a holographic will. I've, I've seen some of those before. So you got to be careful. I think the bottom line is just talk to an attorney. Um, most of these can, can be done relatively inexpensively, uh, especially for folks that have um, moderate estates. The wills tend to be priced according to how, how complex they are, which means for most people they can be done rel- relatively inexpensively. Uh, if you have a lot of money, millions of dollars, uh, trust funds, 
uh, corporations that you own and other businesses, then that's a lot more complex, but you could probably afford a more complex document too. Well, are there certain phrases that need to be in a will? For instance, this may supersede any preceding documents or previous wills that we've created. Things like that, I mean, I would think yeah. those can cause problems. Yes, that, that's actually correct. Um, wills have to contain the right language, and uh, sometimes you can have a will and you write another document later on that's called a codicil to the will. That can be holographic too, and I've seen people actually have a will that was very well prepared and uh, they spent a lot of money on uh, and it was prepared by an attorney, and I've looked at the will and said, this is a great job. And then a year and a half later, that person wrote a codicil, hand, handwritten in their own own writing, and basically reversed half the stuff they did in the will and caused a lot of problems with the estate. So um, you, you've got to make sure that you have the right document in front of you. You've got to make sure it contains the right uh, wording. You, you need to uh, make sure that it's properly executed. That's another thing. I've had people bring in wills to me that were documents that were typed up, signed by them and notarized, uh, which doesn't count in the state of Kentucky uh, because you have to have two witnesses and a notary is just one witness. So, um, you know, there's a lot of technical requirements to a will that aren't really that complex, but it generally helps to have an attorney that's done these before do one for you to make sure all these problems are avoided when it comes to probating the will. Um, and that's another thing, too. You mentioned earlier if you had a will before, you want to make sure that will's um, revoked if you're executing a new one or you want to make sure that the new will fits in with the old will. That, that uh, makes a lot of sense. In, in my practice, it's easier just to revoke the old one and start over. But uh, if, if it's a huge 35-page will, sometimes it's easier just to execute a one-page cut us off. Well, you, you mentioned a term uh, just a few minutes ago. You said the estate. It can complicate the estate. Now, a lot of people listening to this may think, well, I'm not rich. I don't have an estate. We're not talking about you know my, my farm and my mansion and, and yeah. all my cars and all that's really, for legal purposes, not the definition of an estate. Do you want to unpack That's that correct. A bit? An estate for an individual is anything that they own. And uh, if you own a car, if you have a bank account, uh, that is part of your estate. And that will be um, subject to probate if you pass away. Uh, we'll talk, I guess, a little bit in a minute how all that stuff is impacted. But um, if you own anything, if your name is on any piece of property, a car title, a bass boat, a bank account, um, when you pass away, that has to be transferred to somebody else. And the way we do that is through probate. So any of those assets that you own would be subject to probate and would be covered by a will, uh, which, again, it helps to have an executor to be in charge of the will. That person can take the will to court, have it probated, get appointed to be executor, then transfer those assets to wherever they need to go. Uh, and without a will, they just sit there, sometimes incurring property taxes, sometimes decaying, sometimes subject to theft and uh, other things. So um, it's a good idea to uh, have a will, and again, it does take care of your estate. Um, I think where a lot of people get confused is when it's a husband and wife. Yeah. And for a husband and wife, they may have what's called a joint estate. And for a joint estate, that's basically property that they both own. And usually it's intended to pass to the survivors. So a lot of folks have a house in what we call joint ownership with right or survivorship with their spouse. That usually means when the first spouse passes away, it automatically becomes the second spouse. So it's, it's not really part of the estate. It just automatically transfers because of the way the deed's written. Sometimes you can do that with bank accounts. Sometimes you can do that with cars, you know, titled and or um, so uh, that, that doesn't usually become part of the decedent's estate when they pass away. That usually passes on to the survivor. Uh, and people it's say, well, why? As, it's almost as if they're co-owners, so it just, exactly the, the what one it just yeah. continues in that role. Yeah, yeah. And, and people go, well, why do I need a will then if I've got a wife or a husband? And, well, we don't know who's going to pass away first. So we have a will where basically, you know, if somebody passes away, they leave everything to the spouse. And then when that spouse passes away, then we've got a, a record of where it needs to go. So when we do wills for husband and wives, typically it's the husband that passes away first and the wife's going to inherit everything either jointly or through the will. But we, we don't really know for certain who's going to pass away first, and not every husband passes away before the wife. So even for husbands and wives that own most of their property jointly, I think they still need a will because, like I said, we don't know who's going to pass first, and when that second one passes away, that needs to be covered. That makes sense. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about something called a power of attorney. Yeah, I, I call it the triumvirate, triumvirate of the three documents most people need, the will, power of attorney, and living will directive. Uh, power of attorney, we like to call it POA. That's a document that allows you to designate an agent to take care of business on your behalf. 
And that power of attorney can be very simple. For instance, you just want a person to sign a deed for you, uh, and that's the only business they can take care of. Or it can be a very general document that can allow a person to take care of almost any kind of business that you might have, bank accounts. Uh, you can do power of attorneys for the IRS, um, transacting with the insurance company, uh, representing you in a lawsuit if you've been hurt in a car accident and become disabled, um, taking care of business at the post office. Uh, all, all, almost any kind of business that you have can be uh, transferred over to a power of attorney to allow that person to take care of that business for you. And for most couples, I think most people don't realize that for husband and wife, the spouse does not automatically get to sign documents for the other spouse, not in Kentucky. It might be different in other states. But if somebody's buying property, somebody's selling property, you can't just have one spouse there to take care of it. You have to have both spouses, or you have to have a spouse that has the POA power of attorney for the other spouse. So if the husband wants to go to Florida for five weeks and go on a fishing trip, you know, the wife can stay up here in Kentucky and take care of business for him while they're doing that. Uh, if the wife wants to go out to Colorado on a ski trip with, with some of her friends for a while, the husband can take care of business here. And well, why is that important? Well, sometimes interest rates go down, like they're doing right now. They're falling rapidly. Uh, you might want to refinance the house. You can't do that in six or seven weeks. You might lose the interest rates. Uh, sometimes people just don't want to mess with things for a while there. Uh, Metropolitan Sewer District was coming through, adding sewer lines to different properties, and they had to have both spouses sign the documents for that. If somebody was out of town on business or for whatever reason, and they weren't hooked up for the sewer for a while and had other problems. But um, what really becomes important for these power of attorneys is their use as we get older in life. And for most people at some time in their life, they're going to be disabled for some reason. They're going to be in the hospital either for medical treatment, they're going to have some kind of significant disability as we get older, they might be in a nursing home. Um, and in those situations, it's not just a convenience, but it's actually a necessity that somebody have a power attorney to help them take care of business. Otherwise, something can't be done for them. And um, it's important to get these power attorneys done while we're um, competent and know what we're doing as opposed to when we're in a nursing home and are taking a lot of medication and don't really understand what we're doing because it might be too late then. And somebody may be able to actually argue that you didn't know what you were signing, so that's not a valid POA or that's not a valid will. Yeah, so. I, I, I actually try to avoid executing power of attorneys um, at nursing homes and hospitals for that very reason. In fact, a lot of nursing homes and hospitals won't let you execute them on those premises uh, for that very reason. They don't want to be drug into it. So. Uh, typically, if somebody's in a hospital, they're taking some kind of medication. A lot of times it's medication for pain that also might influence their ability to think. And it, at the very least, brings up an argument about their competency. They may still be competent. A lot of times they are. But it brings up that argument, and it's just best to avoid that argument. So the, the best course of action is to make sure you have a power of attorney well before you might be disabled and actually need it. And again, there are various types of powers of attorney documents. I mean, you can, they're very specific. Some of them are broad, depending on what the nature of, right. of the, the usage would be right. and, and what you really actually want to have taken care of. Right. And, and Kentucky's just recently, within the last year, adopted a new law that uh, it's almost a form that you can use the, to name a, they call it an agent, that would be the person that has your power of attorney and transacts business for you. And it lets you check off the authority you want that agent to have. Um, it, it's, it's a new document in Kentucky. It, it makes it a little bit easier to execute. It also gives us a little bit more direction on how it's supposed to be done and how it's supposed to be uh, handled. But uh, it basically spells out all these different duties you're talking about. Uh, another thing, too, is it has some other spaces in it where you can name other things that aren't in these specific duties. No, and that makes a lot of sense. And in full disclosure, you recently did did my <laughs> health care directive, you did my will, and you did my power of attorney or, or various documents that I needed to pull together. And I was very, very happy with, you know, how you, how you did that, how you explained it, and the things that you asked me to think about as we were creating those documents. So much so that I also went back and brought in my college-age son yep. and said, you know what, you're, go you're away at school, you're going to study abroad for the summer, uh, let's get these documents in place. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's, you know, when somebody's got a child that's going to be going out of the country, um, there's all kinds of situations that can come up. There might be student loans that they may need to be executed. There may be something to deal with with a, the college they attend. There may be some other business going on. Well, if you've got a child in Italy 
it's going to be very hard to transact business here in the United States unless somebody has that power of attorney for that person. So if somebody's going to be out of the country for an extended period of time, uh, even if they're a student and don't have a whole lot of assets or don't have a business in their name, I think it's important for them to be able to delegate that authority to somebody else. We really don't know what's going to come up. And uh, you want to be prepared for just about any situation. And, and that makes a lot of sense for me. And just, just the fact that at this point, you know, my son was over 18. Legally speaking, my son is an adult. And so from that standpoint, I, I just thought it was a good idea to really think through that and say, look, you, you're an emancipated adult at this point. you got to have some of this because one, either your mom or I are going to step in and we need to some, have some direction here. One, to cut down on the drama because it's a very emotional situation. Yeah. You could be in a car wreck. You could be uh, – all sorts of things can happen. Yeah, and so having, the, having this already thought through just makes that process a little easier for the people that, again, have to step in. Well, and, and there's other things that could come up. Let's say there was a problem transferring funds from one bank to another while somebody's out of the country, and without a power of attorney, a lot of banks won't deal with anybody on this end of it. So um, there's just a lot of practical reasons for that. I recommend a power of attorney more than I do a will uh, because chances are you're going to need a power of attorney before you need a will. But then the power of attorney is also designed to help the person that signs it. That's really designed to make their life better, simplify their life, help things be taken care of for that individual. I uh, tell folks the will is really for your family. It's nice to have that, but everybody needs a power of attorney. And, and can I rescind that power of attorney? A power of attorney can be rescinded at any time as long as somebody is still competent. So if you become disabled, you can't rescind it. But if you're competent and know what you're doing, you can rescind it at any time, uh, just like you can revise your will if you decide to change your will. It's the same thing with a power of attorney. You can rescind it. Uh, you can amend it. Um, you can draft a new one. Uh, but, again, I think that's probably more important than the will, and I would strongly recommend anybody that's an adult have one. Well, and these power of attorneys can also expire after a certain duty has been has been performed. For instance, if I yeah. live here in Kentucky, I'm going to move to Florida and sell my home, but I'm going to go ahead and head on down there. Yeah. Um, I could appoint the realtor or somebody to be my power of attorney. Just sign those documents so I don't have to come back for that. It, and, it, then it, it, and then it ceases, right? Yeah, exactly. You can put as many limits on a power of attorney as you want to. Like, for instance, it doesn't start till January 1st, 2022. It expires on January 3rd, 2022. Um, it's only good for transfer in real estate. Um, it can be as specific as you want it to be. And, uh, you know, that's generally, there's two types of power of attorney. There's usually that one that's specific where you have somebody transferring a specific piece of real estate for you. Or it's very broad where you don't know what it's going to be used for, so you try to name as much authority as you can grant to somebody because you don't know what somebody's going to need later on. Uh, generally, you're going to name somebody as a close relative, as an agent for one that's very broad that you trust. The one that's going to be more specific is be, going to be something more in the lines of taking care of some kind of business where, like you said, somebody transferring a piece of real estate or something like that. Uh, you know you'll get the deed. You know it'll be over with in a week or two. Uh, but there's a lot of situations that we don't even know about that might come up down the road. And for most people, I think, if they've got a very close relative that they trust with that authority, it's a good idea to have a power of attorney. I tell folks when they execute one, in my office, it's like handing the keys to your car or your house to someone. You only want to give the keys to your car or your house to somebody that you absolutely lose trust with that authority. Because they literally have the authority to sell your house, take the money, and go over to the casino in Indiana and spend it. Now, you would have a lawsuit against them, but if they don't have the money, you're not going to go anywhere. But they have that much authority. They can literally sell your house with a broad power of attorney. And so, again, be specific right. and, and choose somebody, select somebody whom you really trust and understands the situation and understands your wishes and, and what the expectations are. Yeah, if, if you're not going to give the keys to your house to somebody, you don't want them to be your agent for a power of attorney. Uh, the other document we talk about a lot is a living will directive. And this is basically a document that allows somebody to take care of uh, health care decisions for someone. This is it, also called a health care directive or an yeah. advanced health care directive. I've, it, I've heard a lot of different names for yeah, it. Yeah, right? and, and the reason is every state's got a little bit different version of this. Um, in Kentucky, we call it a living will directive. Some other states, I think, call it advanced health care decisions. Um, there, there, there's a lot of different names. It depends on the state. But in Kentucky, again, we, we call it a living will directive. It's not a will in the sense that it comes in after you pass away. It's a living will uh, that's designed to take care of uh, health care decisions while you're alive. Uh, it's uh, essentially a, a statutory form uh, that's been given, us, given to us by the legislature. And I, I tell folks it's like um, 
a power of attorney for health care. Basically, what you're doing is you're allowing somebody else to make health care decisions for you. Now, the way it's worded is it basically doesn't come into play in, unless you can't talk to the or can't make the decisions yourself to the health care providers. But um, it allows you, number one, to name what we call health care surrogates, people to make decisions for you. And number two, it allows you to either give them authority to make any kind of decision that needs to be made, or it gives everybody directives about what you want or do not want. For instance, you do want life-sustaining nourishment, or you do not want life-sustaining nourishment. There are several options you can select on the state of Kentucky form. What I generally recommend to my clients is that they select the option where you designate surrogates, in an, uh, a primary and an alternate, and then you give those surrogates the authority to make any decision that might be made. That's any decision that might be made. And um, I don't like the specific options where you pick or, or don't want health care treatment at specific, specific points. To me, um, those are just too, uh, too specific. Um, you either get it or you don't. There's just too many gray areas in life. You know, um, there's too many options doctors can try. There's, you know, time that can be spent trying to do something else or waiting and if you tell somebody to do something or not doing, it seems to me their hands are tied. So if you give the individuals that your surrogates have been named as the authority to make those decisions, they can decide to try something, not try something, wait a couple of days, see what happens, talk to another doctor. It's just not an automatic, no, we don't get this, or an automatic, yes, we do get this. There's some discretion that's being given to these individuals. And in my opinion, that only works if two other things occur after you execute this document. Number one, um, you trust those few people to make those decisions for you. You just don't want to name somebody off the street. You want to have a conversation with them, too, that you want something in certain situations so they know what you want and they can respect your wishes. Uh, but I, I like naming surrogates and then giving them all the authority they need to make certain decisions. But that also has to have a little bit of background where somebody sits down and talks to them about what they want in certain situations, and then they trust them to follow their wishes. Well, and that's a, that's a real important point. If you're going to assign, if you're going to assign somebody that duty, that that responsibility, you need to talk to them. You don't want to surprise them because you may not be able to find them when you need them. Right. Uh, there's a lot of other things that go on. You need to have that conversation. Well, and because somebody might not want to do it. Well, that's true. I, I've had that situation. I've gone through this discussion with clients, and I've told them, you know, it's probably best to. The, check the box where you give them this authority and they don't check that box. And I've asked them why and they go, well, my wife's not going to pull the plug unless I say it needs to be pulled. And the wife's over there nodding her head going, Gee, he's right. So <laughs> everybody knows their situation better than I do. Right. And, and I appreciate, you know, their, their um, thought process and coming to this decision. And then the other part about this is this is like the, the uh, power of attorney and the will. Uh, these can be revoked and uh, changed at any time also, as long as you're competent. Now, what's really weird about, to me, uh, to me it's weird, I guess, about the Living Will Directive is that you're going to be asked if you have one every time you go to a health care facility, There's actually, especially hospitals. There's actually a federal law that requires them to ask you if you have that. So if you've got one and you're going to go to the hospital, you need to take that with you, let them make a copy of it, and then uh, keep it with you, keep the original with you, and use it to the next hospital you go to. But the flip side of that is if you ever decide to change it, you want to take the new version to the hospital when you go there. And then also important about all this stuff, we talked about talking to the people you named the surrogates. Well, they need to know what you want, and they also need to know where this document is in case they have to use it. Scott, let me ask you this. Um, we've talked about you know all of this as it pertains to Kentucky, your license to practice in Kentucky. If somebody is moving into Kentucky, let's say they're coming from Ohio or they're coming from Wyoming or wherever, do their documents that were drafted in those home states, are they valid when they get here? They, they should be. Um, and the reason I say it should be is because in, in, in the United States, the Constitution requires one state to recognize um, things that happen in another state. For instance, there was a real big argument about whether or not uh, marriages that were valid in one state were valid in another state for a while. Well, if, if marriage is valid in one state in the United States, it's valid in all the states. Same thing about wills. If a will is valid in the state of Kentucky, when it's executed, it's valid in all the other states. Uh, same thing about power of attorneys. Same things about living will directives. Um, wills and power of attorneys, generally, my experience has been, generally they have the same format in just about every state, the ones I've seen. I haven't seen every state, but the ones I have seen seem to have the same format. 
Um, the only big difference between those is sometimes one state might require three signatures, whereas another state might require one or two. So, uh, but if you're in Indiana that requires three signatures and you have a will that was executed in Kentucky that only requires two, your will is still valid because it was valid in Kentucky when it was executed. It was valid in the state in which the it state, was exactly. executed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the, the problem I, I see is sometimes you have folks that don't know the legal aspects of this, and they're used to one type of form, and that might be the clerk who's used to the Kentucky form for the power of attorney uh, that works at a bank. But more importantly, I think it's probably the healthcare care profi- professionals because we have a certain format of the living will directive in Kentucky, and I would assume that most healthcare professionals in Kentucky are used to it, but Indiana's format is different. So if you had treatment in Indiana, they may just not recognize it. It might have to be explained to them a little bit. Same thing about somebody coming from Indiana to Kentucky. If you use the Indiana form in Kentucky, it's still valid, but it might take a while for the healthcare professionals who aren't attorneys to understand exactly what's going on. But um, it is comedy between two states. If the, if the document was valid in the state it was executed, it's going to be valid in the other states where you go to. You well, may have to jump through a couple extra hoops, but it should sure, be valid. Sure. Yeah. And again, because of the immense power that a POA or a living will directive actually conf- conveys to the other person who's going to make those decisions, you really want to make sure that if you go through, for instance, a divorce, that you do sit down and remember, hey, I really need to update those documents. Yeah. So some of these documents are automatically updated um, by the divorce. For instance, if you leave something to a spouse in Kentucky and get divorced and, and you don't change your will, that, that spouse is taken out of the will. Problem is if you have other things going to other individuals that might have been somehow related to that spouse that you don't want anything getting now. So um, anytime you go through a divorce, it's always a good idea to have somebody look at all those documents you've executed before. Don't think the divorce automatically cancels the power of attorney, so you need to get that checked out. Same thing with the living will directive. Um, so uh, the will is the older document of the three. Um, a divorce probably is automatically going to change the will, but the other documents are very important to look at. Um, that makes sense. I don't really want my ex-wife deciding whether or not no. to pull the plug. So No, it's, <laughs> but I have folks that who, that is what they want, too. Yeah, yeah. In, in that some, it depends on the individual uh, circumstances. Yeah, right? and, and it's hard for the hospital to figure out exactly whether or not you've been divorced, and if you yeah. have been, if you want yeah. the ex-spouse. So um, the bottom line is probably execute a new set of documents once that happens. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's transition then to probate. And this is the thing that I think is, is a little challenging for a lot of people. Hey, I've got a will. I've got all this other stuff done. What's this probate thing all of a sudden? Probate's the way we transfer assets from somebody that's passed away and put those in the hands of the people that should get them. So probate occurs when somebody dies. Um, the first question I ever ask myself in probate is if there are any assets in the estate, the estate we were just talking about. Because if there aren't any assets in the estate, then there's no reason to go through probate, even if they have a will. Um, it still may be a good idea to probate the will in case something's found, but if there's no assets, there's really nothing to take through probate. But um, the first question I ask is, you know, what was in this person's estate? And that gets back to what I was talking about earlier with the spouses. Most people that are married in Kentucky own property jointly, especially real estate, houses. I, I, I don't think I've yet seen a couple that owned a house individually um, that w- the, the, the real estate was bought while they were married. Almost everybody that buys a house is going to get it titled in joint ownership, joint ownership with right or survivorship. Um, and similarly, they'll have their cars that way. A lot of times they'll have the bank accounts that way. And wh- what this means is they both own it, but the title of this asset has been set up in a way where if one of them passes away, it automatically becomes the other person's. And typically it's the husband that passes away. So if the husband passes away, it automatically becomes the wife. If the wife passes away first, it automatically becomes the husband. Uh, Most people will own almost all their property that way if they're married. So the first thing we look at, especially for married couples, is to see how they own their property. Uh, Most of the time the house is that way, so there's not really anything that needs to be done right now for the house. A lot of the bank accounts are set up that way, so there's not anything to be done that way. The car is set up that way, there's not anything to be done that way. We assume that the personal property in the house, the furniture, all the household goods are also owned that way. They're not titled. You're not going to title a couch, but we're just going to assume that 
for the purposes that's that's the way they intended it because all of their other property that way is that way. So when the first spouse passes away, there's really not anything to be done uh, with the estate. L- let me ask you this question, and again, it's just you got me thinking about that when you said mo- when they go to buy a house, a lot of times it's in both spouses' name. What happens if if we're adults, a little bit older and le- older in age, and you get married, and one person moves into the other person's house. So we haven't really retitled it yet. So, yes, there's a marriage there. Does that present a problem if, if this hasn't been taken care of? It can because it becomes really cloudy about who owns it then. Um, the first thing we look at to determine ownership is the deed, and if the deed's in the first person's name that bought it, bought it while, before they were married, then there's a presumption that they own it. Now, the next question is, did the person that got married that moved in also contribute to paying for the equity and, and the house through the mortgage and upkeep? And uh, maybe there were some revisions made. Um, um, you know, do they have a dower or a curtsy interest in any of this property too? Um, all that becomes a little bit more cloudy and it becomes a little bit more sp- fact specific. Um, and that's something that you need to address with an attorney about how you want to handle it. There may be some other documents that need to be drafted to make sure that goes exactly where you want it to go. But um, that is one of the things that makes this more complicated. I don't know how else to describe yeah. it. Um, generally, like I said, most people are going to presume that was the owner's house, the person that bought it to begin with, but there's still a lot of things that can cloud the title to that. And those are some things that you need to discuss with an attorney and see if there's going to be some problems and see how you want to handle things down the road. But that makes it more complicated. That's the best way to describe it without going into a tangent for another hour and a half. No, that makes sense. But, but at the same time, having all these documents that we're talking about, having these discussions ahead of time yeah. does kind of make things a lot easier yeah, exactly. when they're actually uh, in play. Exactly. Um, one, of the, one of the other issues with probate um, has to do with the amount of assets available. Is that correct? Yeah, now another way, uh, again, I told you earlier, what we want to see is what is in the estate. We want to determine whether or not we have to go through probate. Uh, Kentucky has what's called a spousal exemption, and currently it's $30,000. And what that means is that the spouse, the surviving spouse, um, gets the first $30,000 of an estate if somebody passes away. Uh, And typically where we see this is the house was owned jointly, the bank accounts were jointly, but the husband liked to do trade with the cars with the the automobile dealership. So the car was in his name. Uh, And let's say he's got a Buick that's worth $10,000. Well, uh, that's in his name. He's passed away. Um, So the long way of doing it is go through probate, open up an account with the probate court, have an executor appointed, transferring that asset to the spouse, um, that's complicated, expensive, and takes at least six months to do. Uh, because of the spousal exemption, we can use this $30,000 exemption um, to ask the court to dispense with probate. Basically fill out one form, filing fee for the court, and we ask the court to transfer that one asset to the spouse. And the court says, okay, they got $30,000, this is only $10,000, we'll go ahead and use this for that. And what that does is a couple things. Number one, it saves a ton of money. Uh, because you don't have to hire an attorney to go downtown, uh, open up the estate, which means you also got to run through the estate and close down the estate. Uh, so it saves a whole lot in legal fees, but secondly, it's a lot faster. Uh, once an estate's opened up, you generally have to wait six months for all the creditors to file proof of claims against the estate. Um, this allows the estate to be closed down very, very fast because um, the first $30,000 is going to go to the spouse no matter how many creditors are out there. And uh, it is just a lot more efficient, a lot easier and a lot cheaper to do it this way. Um, I, I, I see this a lot, like I said, where the husband likes to trade with the cars. Uh, every now and then you'll have a bank account somewhere, uh, maybe some stocks, maybe some uh, money that was uh, set aside somewhere for some reason. Um, and as long as the total assets this individual owned are less than $30,000, we can do this dispense, which means that you can add the cost for a funeral to this too. That's the debt of the state. So if they had a $10,000 funeral, you can usually usually use up to $40,000 uh, to dispense with probate. So the reason I'm bringing all this up, a lot of people aren't aware of it, um, but it's a really easy way to take care of something that's not really worth going through probate. For instance, if you've got a $500 car, it doesn't make sense to pay a couple thousand dollars to go through probate. That makes a lot of sense. Now, is there something that has to do with uh, if children are involved? Does that affect probate, or does that 
cause problems or make things more simple? Well, um, first of all, for that spousal ex- excuse me, spousal exemption, the children can use that if 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 both I don't know how to say this if the surviving spouse is the only one left. For instance, um, if it's a married couple, and one of them dies, the surviving spouse can use a spousal exemption. If the first spouse has passed away and the surviving spouse passes away, then the children can use a spousal exemption. So they can use this $30,000 benefit also to transfer assets. And for folks that don't have a whole lot of assets in their name, $5,000 in a bank account, something like that, um, they may have been in a nursing home for a while, it's, it's another easy way to um, close down the, expa- the estate inexpensively and without a whole lot of problems. No, that makes sense. So um, if you've got to go through probate, let's kind of talk about the process. So uh, assuming I've got a will, yeah. kind of what happens? That's the best case scenario. I've already kind of thought about right. this a little bit. So Right. There's, there's two things that happen with probate. One, if you've got a will, testate it. Another, if you don't have a will, intestate. If you've got a will, then, um, and we can't figure out a way to keep it from going through probate, what we do is we have to probate the will. We, we take the will down to the courthouse. Um, we have to figure out if the will is self-proving or not. If it's self-proving, and almost every will we do, in our office is self-proving. Um, the what, court, what does that mean? Okay. Um, in Kentucky, a will can be self-proving if it's witnessed by two people and then a notary witnesses the witness's signature. So it requires three people, and we actually have witnesses and then a witness to the witness that's a notary. And there's a, cu- a couple other things that have to be met, but um, if it meets the specific format of a uh, self-proving will, um, it saves a lot of time and effort in probate. If it is not a self-proving will, then we have to have the witnesses show up in court and testify that they saw this person execute it, which can be difficult if it's a 40, 50, 50 year old will. Um, sometimes you can find those witnesses, sometimes you can't, but it takes extra effort to find them, and even if they're available, they still have to be located, uh, let them know that they need to appear in pro- probate court at a certain time, confirm they're gonna be there. It, it takes a little bit more leg work to get that done. Uh, but typically what I find in these self-proving, non-self-proving wills is we can't locate the witnesses. They were done in 1955. The witnesses are no longer around. If they are around, they're in a nursing home and they're infirm. In that situation, we've got to prove it's the testator's signature by two disinterested people that can prove they have seen that signature before and they believe it's the testator's signature. So what that requires is even more legwork. So if you don't have a self-proving will, you can count on a little bit extra time and more legal expenses trying to prove the will. Uh, assuming we get the will proven, self-proving or not, uh, and assuming the court accepts it, uh, the will normally will appoint an executor. And the executor is the captain of the ship for the estate, the probate estate. The executor's person in charge. or the person that signs all the documents. It's their decision about what to sell, when to sell it. Um, it's almost like a CEO of a corporation. In this case, the CEO is the executor. The corporation is the estate. So the executor is in charge of taking care of the estate, and their main duty, if there is a will, is to follow the terms of the will. Um, generally, that requires that debts be paid first. Uh, there might be some miscellaneous requirements in the will about you know giving fifty dollars to charity or something like that, making sure all those directions are followed, and then making sure the assets are distributed according to the terms of the will, and then they close the estate down. The executor has a fiduciary duty to make sure that things are done properly. Uh, that means they have to make sure that things are handled in the right way and they can actually be sued by the heirs if they're not. If there is no will and um, the court has to appoint somebody to be in charge of the estate, in Kentucky we call that person an administrator uh, who basically has the same duty as an executor. Um, there's a couple problems with the administrator. First of all, we have to figure out who that's going to be. If you don't name an executor in the will and we've got to appoint an administrator, well, we've got to figure out who that is. And there's a statute that gives us a list of people that can be the administrator. For instance, your spouse, your parents. Um, where it gets to be a problem is if it gets down to the point where it's going to be brothers and sisters and you've got seven or eight brothers and sisters. Um, let's say you've got seven brothers and sisters. They all have an equal right to be appointed administrator. Well, which one's going to be appointed? Well, the problem is they all have an equal right. So in that situation, we try to get people that don't want to handle this to waive their right and name a certain individual just to make this a little bit easier. But if that can't be done, then the court has to figure out who's going to be the administrator. And usually what they're going to do, if two or three people want to be the administrator have an equal right, they'll make them co-administrators. 
which can be a problem if you've ever had three captains of a ship. You know, Absolutely. one wants to go north, the other one south, the other one east. So that generally tends to delay things, which means it's going to be more expensive and, and cost more if you've got multiple uh, administrators. Um, and sometimes you can't even find somebody that will be an administrator. And the court usually appoints somebody called the public administrator to do that, who's a private attorney here in, in Louisville, uh, which means they're going to charge you private attorney rates to take care of this business. And generally somebody you point as an executor or a friend that's going to, a relative that's going to be an administrator are not going to charge the same kind of fees. Uh, executors and administrators are entitled to a fee for the work they, they do. Um, generally it's limited to 5% of the personality of the state. It can be more in certain, certain situations. What, what does that mean, the personality of the estate? Um, not real estate. Okay, okay. Yeah, and, and you know, if somebody owns $5 million in uh, CDs and all the administrator does is cash those in, generally the court's not going to let them have 5% of that as a value. Uh, the work has to be reasonable too. But um, it's nice to have somebody you trust be in charge of things. It's nice to name that person in the will. Um, I always have the question, you know, I've got three kids. I want to name them all as co-executors. And I usually say, well, pick out one of them. The other two will thank you later on if you don't name them, if they ever understand exactly what the executor has to do. Um, but it's just so much easier for me as an attorney when I only have to call one person. Absolutely. Or have one person come in and sign. Um, but to have two people who have different ideas about where to go can be a real problem sometimes. Well, it's already an emotional time. You've got a parent or, or a sibling who's just passed. Yeah, it's just a recipe for, for disaster yeah, sometimes. There, there's a lot of similarities between uh, the emotions in a divorce and uh, uh, an estate. Everybody that's going through an estate has suffered the loss of somebody they love. Um, some people handle those that loss in different ways, some good, some bad. Um, some people don't know how to handle it. And um, sometimes that can just make the administration of the estate difficult. But, uh, again, it's, it's very emotional, as you would expect. Um, and generally when people have a lot of emotions, it just makes it a little bit more difficult to go through. That, that makes a lot of sense. So that's assuming, obviously, somebody died with a will and appointed an executor or, or a female would be an executrix. So they've got, they've got, exactly. that, they've got that in. What happens if there's no will? Well, again, that's when the estate goes through an administration, and okay. we call the person the administrator or administratrix. Um, and, again, we've got to figure out who that's going to be. Um, and once that person is appointed, they have basically the same duties as a test, as the uh, executor. Um, they're in charge of the estate. Um, they have a du fiduciary duty to the estate and its heirs to make sure things are done properly. Um, it's very similar once we get to that point to the administration of an estate that has a will. The main difference is the will will tell us what needs to be done with the assets. And without a will, there's certain statutes that tell us what to be done with the assets and who essentially gets those assets. Um, so with a will, you know, you may have three children. Um, one of them may be disabled, and you want to make sure that child's taken care of, and the other two are, you know, stand-up stand uh, executives in business and pop stars, I don't know, um, but well off and don't need any help. Um, if you have a will, you can name your state to go to the child that's disabled that needs it. If you don't have a will and go through the administration process, then they all get equal shares. So um, that's another benefit of the will. Um, and, uh, again, um, everybody's situation is different. The state of Kentucky has basically come up with a statute to tell us how to do things without a will. But it's not what everybody needs, not what everybody wants. No, and, and again, this is complicated stuff. So... If you're listening to this, it's a yeah. great time to consider maybe getting a hold of Scott or another attorney and sitting down and saying, you know what, let's get these documents in place. I, I think that's that's just good planning, and it's also better on your heirs and those people who are going to survive in, in the event of your passing that have to now deal with this. Yeah, and again, uh, there's three documents that we're involved here with, will, power of attorney, and living will directive, and everybody's very familiar with the will. Um but uh, the power of attorney, I think, is the one that's not looked at enough and people don't understand. It's just not discussed as much uh, that people really need to think about because that's usually the one that's used as we get older and helps folks take care of uh, business. Now, um, there are ways to avoid probate. Um, there's a lot of different ways to avoid probate. Uh, probably the easiest way to avoid probate is to give all your assets away before you die. <laughs> 
Absolutely. You know, I've the, seen I've seen people uh, attempt that. That the, the one the one thing that you had, you had told me about earlier that we're not going to get in on this podcast though that if Medicaid is involved, um, there is a five year look back. So you've got to be real that's careful true. There. there. There's also some tax consequences for yeah. inheritance taxes and stuff that yeah. really most people don't have to think about. But, but um, again, that's a story for a different day. Th- that's a very complicated issue. Um, but you know, uh, for most people that have the typical estate. Uh, that are not worried about the Medicare, Medicaid issues, a will, power of attorney, living will directives can take care of most of their uh, yeah. situations. Yeah. Uh, avoiding probate can get complicated in the sense that it's a little bit more than just giving your stuff away. There's that look-back period you were talking about. There's also a gift tax in the United States if you give a certain amount. Uh, most people, that's not really going to have an impact because the deduction is so high. But the main thing is if you give your house away by putting your name, I'm sorry, putting your children's name on the house instead of yours, and you decide to go to Florida, well, they've got to sign off on that. <laughs> and that gets more complicated if you gave it to a child and their wife, uh, and they got divorced, and now the divorced wife has to sign off on it. Um, so uh, it, it's more complicated than just giving it away. Uh, but that is a way to avoid probate. There's other ways to avoid probate, too, creating trust where you transfer assets into trust. Um, and, and, and other ways, too, uh, payable on death accounts, uh, life insurance policies, things like that. Uh, most people will spend more, my, more time and money, this has been my experience, trying to avoid probate than we actually spend in probate. But um, they're scared of probate. Uh, and from what I understand, other states have very, very significant probate taxes and a lot more complicated procedures than the state of Kentucky. Um, for Kentucky, there's really no inheritance tax if the estate's going to a close relative like a spouse or a child. Um, there's some federal inheritance taxes that right now kick in a little bit over $10 million, but for most people, that's not going to be a worry for them. Uh, other states, especially the ones up northeast, have more significant probate taxes. So I think what we get is a lot of feedback from uh, the media, especially centered up northeast, about problems they have with their probate. But I've seen a lot of people try to avoid probate, and and they've actually spent a lot more time and effort uh, than what was probably going to be required if we just did a will and went through the estate process with the regular probate. No, that makes sense, Scott. Uh, again, I appreciate all this information because I mean, as you're as you're well aware, it wasn't that long ago that you and I sat down and prepared all these documents. And, and one, I sleep better. One, yeah. I I know my kids. You know, I've sat down and discussed with them you know, what the situation is. So they're aware of it and they know where the documents are. They know, you know, what they need to do and what, what's, you know, how things are going to, for the most part, play out. And, you know, I just, again, I, I sleep better knowing that I've taken some of the responsibilities off of their shoulders and I've written them down so that they know, okay, this is what dad wanted. This is, you know, what he intended. And hopefully that's going to save a lot of problems down the road. Sometimes families you know, really break apart uh, over the, the, the silliest of things. And I'm trying to really, really, you know, avoid that. Well, and, and that's a perfect example of why it should be done, what you just mentioned. Everybody that executes a will, you can almost see them go, ah, afterwards. Um, and uh, a lot of people put it off, um, put it off really too long, to be honest with you. Uh, but again, um, the power of attorney, I want to bring everything back <laughs> to that. Uh, because uh, that is the document that's designed really to help you while you're alive. And it seems to be underappreciated by a lot of people and probably is the one document I don't see used that should be used a lot more. I think so. Well, my friend, I, I, once again, I appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on this topic, and we'll talk to you next time. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Louisville Probate Law Podcast with Attorney Scott Shanest. The content provided is for informational purposes only and does not establish an attorney-client relationship. For additional information, visit louisvilleprobatelaw.com.